Now we're going to start on the second part of chapter 18. And as is the case with the entire cardiovascular system, this is very information heavy, information rich. So you'll definitely want to outline as you watch today's recorded lecture and then go back and replay parts of the video in which you feel that you need more attention. So let's get started again. Chapter 18, part two. Today, we're going to focus on leukocytes and platelets. So the characteristics of leukocytes are shown here. Leukocytes are less numerous than the red blood cells. They also possess distinct nuclei and can therefore perform metabolism. They can leave the circulation and then once they're outside the bloodstream, the white blood cells are attracted to potential infections and possible injuries. So we talked a little bit about this in AMP1, when we were talking about the integument. We call this process of the white blood cells attraction to the potential infections, positive chemostasis. And we'll see that in the next slide. This basically means they're moving toward a chemical stimuli. White blood cells also lack hemoglobin pigment. Here you can see how the white blood cells can leave circulation and move about via immigration. They can then exit the blood vessels. And as you can see here, they then move through the connective tissue going toward the site of the injury. Leukocytes like Acenophils and neutrophils, which we will examine next, have granules, and they can release chemicals from their granules that will ultimately destroy the pathogens and are also capable of the process of phagocytosis. So again, this brings us back to our study of tissue healing in AMP1. We learned that phagocytosis is wound, uh, not wound eating, but uh, basically uh, pathogen eating. Right, we can look at the different types of leukocytes here. What I learned when I was in school is the uh, mnemonic grandpa Ben. So grandpa for granular. So granular leukocytes are basophils, eosinophils, and neutrophils. And so that would leave us for agranular being the monocytes and the lymphocytes. So the sites here are agranular and then the granular grandpa Ben. B-E-N, basophil, acenophil, neutrophil. And then some more mnemonics to look at the granulated versus agranulated. Another one is every boy needs mommy's love. Every boy needs, there is your granular. Mommy's love, there is the, your agranular. And then you'll start to learn more about the relative quantities as well. So to study the relative quantities, you can remember the expression, never let monkeys eat bananas. So that essentially means the neutrophils are the most numerous and the basophils are the least numerous. And you'll need that for healthcare. So again, granulated versus agranulated, eosinophils, basophils, and neutrophils are your granular. And then the agranulocytes, the monocytes, and the lymphocytes, which we just mentioned. Then we get into the leukocyte disorders here on this slide. Leukopenia is an abnormally low white blood cell count. And it's commonly induced by drugs such as glucocorticoids, which we talked a little bit about in AMP1, and also anti-cancer agents. Leukocytosis is an increase in white blood cell count, indicating an infection. Infectious mononucleosis, which can also be referred to as the kissing disease, is caused by the Epstein-Barr virus. And it results in an excessive number of atypical agranulocytes. Then we have leukemia, which is a cancerous condition of white blood cells. And it's named after the predominant cell type involved. 
So if it's acute leukemia, it's a quick advancing cancer derived from lymphoblasts. Then we have uh, chronic leukemia, which is a slow advance in cancer derived from the late stages of myoblasts. So the acute leukemia can also be referred to as lymphoid leukemia or lymphatic or lymphocytic leukemia. And the chronic leukemia could also be referred to as myeloid leukemia. Now let's talk a little bit about thrombocytes. So thrombocytes are our platelets. And we have some of the characteristics of thrombocytes or platelets shown here. Platelets are less than half the size of red blood cells. They're the second most numerous of the three formed elements. And they're not true cells, but instead they're cytoplasmic fragments of larger cells. And sometimes we also call those megacarocytes. Um, I should say megacarocytes. The production of them is regulated by thromboplylidin and their lifespan is only about nine to 12 days. Then we have something called hemostasis, which essentially is blood clotting. So let's talk about that. So all the stages of blood clotting are shown here. There's a first vascular phase where smooth muscle contractions attempt to vasoconstrict the blood vessels to reduce the blood flow to the damaged area. This phase is stimulated by serotonin and endothelium. There's then the next phase here, where uh, platelet phase basically is where the platelets aggregate and stick to the exposed collagen fiber. The next phase is the coagulation phase, which you can see moving down here. This phase is known as blood clotting. And it's the formation of a clot, which involves two chemical pathways. One is intrinsic and the other is extrinsic. So this results in the conversion of what we call soluble fibrinogen, which moves into insoluble, insoluble fibrin. This phase involves the formation of what we call prothrombin activator. And then it involves the conversion of prothrombin to thrombin and then the conversion of soluble fibrinogen to insoluble fibrin. The next stage of the blood clotting and repair involves clot retraction. This is where the platelets contract to pull on the surrounding fibrin strands, compacting the clot and encouraging vessel healing. So here's where we get more into what we're discussing back in AMP1 with the wound healing. And then the process continues next to PDGF, which is the platelet-derived growth factor, stimulates the cell division of the smooth muscle and connective tissue to repair the wall of the vessel. And then finally, we have fibrinolysis, which is where the fibrin strands are broken by an active enzyme. And there's a number of clotting factors that are involved in this process, which are also shown on this picture here. And the clotting factors, some of these, which we mentioned earlier, such as the fibrinogen and the prothrombin and the calcium ions, the PDGF, the ATP, all these are important in blood clotting and repair. And then the final phase of hemostasis that we talked about, we have the clot retraction and the repair, and now finally fibrinolysis. So now there's a number of clotting disorders which we should be cognizant of. This is the basic process. Again, when things are happening correctly, there's a bunch of clotting factor that helps those things happen correctly. And then there's disorders when these things don't happen correctly. So these are the different pathologies that we'll wanna be mindful of. We have something called thrombus, which is when a clot develops in an unbroken blood vessel. We have an embolus, which is a thrombus that is freely floating in the bloodstream. We have something known as hemophilia, which is the condition that involves the inability to clot because of the missing clotting factor. 
Hemophilia can be broken down into hemophilia A, B, and C, which we're not quite going to get into right now. But also know that the clotting factors, uh, if a missing clotting factor is the case, can cause hemophilia. Uh, it's also a sex link inheritance disease. Then we have thrombocytopenia, which is where you have low numbers of circulating platelets, which can cause spontaneous bleeding. Another clotting disorder is the impaired liver function, which results in vitamin K deficiencies and therefore causes the impaired coagulation. And then finally, we have disseminated intravascular coagulation, or DIC, which is widespread clotting that results in the reduction of the amount of platelets and the fibrinogen available in the blood. So the liver cannot produce more fibrinogen. Basically what happens um, is it wouldn't be able to keep pace with the clotting and the clotting will decline and essentially uncontrolled bleeding could result. And then finally today, we'll look at some blood typing. Now this could be a little tricky. So we'll definitely do more of this in lecture, in actual class. But blood typing is based on the presence of specific antigens. And they're found on the surface of red blood cells. And also blood typing has to do with the presence of specific antibodies. So we have the antigens and the antibodies. Since blood types are named according to the antigens that are present on the red blood cell, we call the system the ABO system. And then not to make things too complicated, we also have something called the RH factor, which is another component and it's named from the first discovery in the rhesus monkey. And here you can see the various blood types on this slide here. The A blood type is where a person possesses only the A antigen on their red blood cell surface. And so if they have the A antigen, they'll also possess anti-B antibodies because they're anti-B, they're, red, they're um, red blood cell type A. The B blood type is where a person possesses only the B antigen on the red blood cell surface. And naturally they will possess the anti-A antibody. The AB blood type is when a person possesses both the A and B antigens on the red blood cell surface. And so since they have both the A and B antigens, they'll possess neither the anti-A or anti-B antibody. And then finally, the O blood type is where a person possesses neither the A or B antigen on the surface, and they will possess both an anti-A and anti-B antibody. So the antibodies are located in the plasma. The RH system, as I noted, is named from its first discovery in the rhesus monkey. Individuals' red blood cells possess the D antigen. And when they do possess the D antigen, they are considered RH positive. When they're without this so-called D antigen, they're said to be RH negative. So testing these blood types involves looking for the type of antigen that is present on the surface of the red blood cell. So we can take a sample of known antibody like the anti-A or anti-B or the RH factor anti-D and place an unknown blood sample in that solution of antibody. And we can look for what we kind of consider a clumping reaction. If the corresponding antigen is present, then the antibody and the antigen will come together and they form like a lock and key mechanism that can generally cause what we call agglutination. And you can see here some of that agglutination reaction occurring. And here's more blood sampling with some agglutination going on. 
We'll also review more of this in class. And there's a game here that you can play after we review it in class and go over it in more detail to determine what blood a person should get based on their antigens and antibodies. And then we'll finish here with a quick summary of the blood types in the United States. And that concludes our lecture for chapter 18, part two.